Today I'm sharing with you some information that is so important that I think it's on the in the category of when I interviewed Gert van den Bosch in 2021 and Shankara Shetty as well. This is this is I can sense is very important. And what I can tell you is that as soon as I started to share this information, it started to get censored all over the place. And so I know that there is something very important here. But the science is complex, and I have only started the process of trying to dissect what it means. So what you have to do is make sure you hear it from the person who is stepping forward to share it. There is a link to the interview on Substack with Christy Grace. She is dissecting something that I don't think anybody else has seen, but this is big. So make sure you take a look at it. In order for you to have a better understanding of what you're going to watch, I'm just going to share a little bit about the science. And that's what we'll be doing. And essentially what she did or what she said is that she found an important point with regards to adducts. These are in modified RNA and, and lipid nanoparticles injectables. And so you can see this was a presentation by Christy Grace. She goes through it in the Substack link. And the reason I'm highlighting it is because it, it, this is occurring or this happened or this was not analyzed because of a very simple point. The mRNA platform was designed in terms of COVID as a vaccine. And this is such an important point. When you look at the regulatory guidelines, ICHM7 on genotoxins, this is what they look at whenever you're using genetic, genetic interventions. Now, it just so happens that because of the pandemic, you had an interesting loophole because suddenly a vaccine is a vaccine. It's not a genetic product. And this is this is something that used to cause censorship. If anybody said that, it would be called misinformation. But there is a reason why these regulations are in place, because even if you put it on a different track, I suspect that the regulators should still answer this kind of question with regards to what Christy was talking about here, looking at the impact of certain genotoxins on DNA, RNA, and proteins. And as I said, it is a guideline, a regulatory guideline for the pharmaceutical industry. It just so happened that this went a different path. So what she has done is reanalyzed it, and she is asking the question as to whether or not there are certain impacts that really haven't been in detail assessed and should be. That's really the question that she has. And I am telling you that this is causing problems. It is it, it has been censored, not, not here yet, but it has been censored elsewhere essentially calling it misinformation, even to ask the question. And what she is asking for is that she's saying, you need to do the research. And she's calling on the authorities to do the necessary research to make sure that this is assessed. So just to give you a little bit of the science as to what that question is, here are a few basic points. And you have to remember, this is something new to me as well. And I am myself trying to understand what these implications could be if correct. So when we look at a lipid nanoparticle from the COVID vaccine, what you can see is that it is in this circular um, bubble. And these are the lipids on the outside. And inside is the modified RNA. And this is what you're trying to get inside the cell so that it can make the spike protein. And this is what the spike protein RNA would look like. And 
this is how it triggers an immune response. And most of the arguments have been around what impact these can have and ongoing circulation and so on. And in the midst of all of this controversy, one of the really important questions is what happens to the lipid nanoparticle? Once it has delivered the product, is it any relevant any relevance? Is it does it just disappear? So this is really the question that she is going for. So she's not even targeting the question about the modified M the mRNA from the vaccine. She's going from a different angle. And what you have to remember is that in terms of a cell, once you have the situation where the this is just a normal human cell, and you would imagine that the lipid nanoparticle would cross inside, would then get into the lysosome. Now, you can see how beautiful this cell is. It is really complex, you know, multiple layers. This is the nucleus here. You know, these are the mitochondria. I uh, have the smooth Golgi um, apparatus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So all of these sophisticated systems are around. But in terms of lipid nanoparticles, they get into these lysosomes, which digest them and release the mRNA, which can then get picked up in the cell and converted to spike protein, which triggers the immune response. So fine, everything seems straightforward. But as I said, Krista's question was not simply about the mRNA. Her question was a little bit deeper and more complex. She is asking, well, what happens to the lipid nano nanoparticle and more specifically, specific parts of it? So this here is from Inside Therapeutics. I thought this was a really good image and it's showing you in detail what that lipid nanoparticle would be. And it has them all colored. So in this gold yellow, you have cholesterol. You don't have to worry about the cholesterol because the body uses it all the time and it will just pick it up. The RNA, as we said, would be converted into a spike protein or degraded if it isn't. Phospholipids, again, are pretty straightforward. They can be degraded, reused, and so they are a part of normal human physiology. But inside the lipid nanoparticle, or well, let's just finish, you have these peg lipids on the outside, and this helps the lipid nanoparticle to evade the immune system so it doesn't destroy it. And on the inside, you have to stabilize this modified RNA. And you have these ionizable lipids that hold it protected and keep it in place. Once it has released the RNA, what happens to these ionizable lipids? And that's really the main focus that Christy was focused on, or what she's talking about. I liken it, and this is my analogy, just in case there's somebody who would like to criticize it, but my analogy for these ionizable lipids is more like plastic. You know, you go to the supermarket, you get your plastic bags and you put your, your groceries in it, you come home and then you have a stack of plastic bags and then you have to get rid of it. But guess what? They don't biodegrade so easily. And so you have to use landfills. And if they get in the ocean, they then kill the fish and all kinds of strange things happen because we don't have a good way of getting rid of plastic. In the same way, I look at these ionizable lipids. They are not easily destroyed. So the body, once they, it's in the cell, they then have to do certain actions. They have to attach it onto something, then send it into the bloodstream where it gets picked up by the liver largely. Then it's degraded and connected to something else. And then it's taken out in the bile, which will then go out in the feces. And it takes weeks for the body to dispose of that. And so it leads us back to what Christy was talking about, because it's not straightforward for the body to get rid of it. There are a number of points that she said are really important, because these products 
can then become adox, which is a product that binds to another larger biological molecule like DNA, RNA, or a protein and becomes almost like superglue. And adducts are all around and they can form toxic agents. Smoking has some of the aldehydes causes adducts as well. This is what can lead to cancer. And so this complex situation as to what happens is really what she's asking. And here she's shown that one of these lipid nanoparticles degrade, but then you have fragmented RNA, which can then attach to these uh, lipids to form adducts, permanent bonds that then interfere with how this is handled. Complex science. So her question is quite simple. When a study was done in 2021, um, this study here was looking at that question about adducts with regards to lipid nanoparticles. It was actually, I think, um, commissioned by Moderna um, to clarify that question, which is good. But it raised some points with regards to what happens with the temperature. Because what they found is that these constituents, the higher the temperature, the higher the percentage of adduct formation. So at minus 20 it was lowest, but at almost 40 degrees, it was highest. And you can see the time in months. So there is no doubt that this occurs because this was done by industry. They just didn't follow it up in any great detail. Maybe they assumed it wasn't relevant. But the problem is, is that the human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So it's closest to the 40 and therefore, in theory, will lead to the highest amount of adduct formation. The question is, is it relevant? Now, what I have noticed happening is that asking the question is causing censorship. It's not that anybody is, it's almost as if don't ask the question because it's irrelevant, but we know it's relevant because they looked at it, but nobody seems to have done any further research on it. And essentially what Christie was asking is, are we having a situation where in a percentage of people, this is not going to be everybody, who are struggling to dispose of these lipid nanoparticles, could they then be at risk of these particles attaching to proteins, RNA, DNA, and forming toxic bonds that then cause disease? That's essentially the question that she's asking. And that's the question it seems that they don't want to answer because they know it does happen. They just don't know how frequently and how long. This is important stuff. And so if you want to be ahead or just right at the forefront of the science, you need to listen to this interview. It's a very, very important interview. The link is in the description below. It's broken down into subsections. And as best as possible, Christy is trying to dissect and simplify the science so that you can understand what she's asking. Remember, in science, you can ask a question. It doesn't mean you're right. But by asking the question, you have the opportunity to make sure that a problem that is relevant is not occurring. As far as I know, that's still good science. It just may be inconvenient science. So your job is to share this, like it, comment on it. Let as many people see this video and then go and watch the video with Christy. Force the people who are scientific, especially, to go and look at this. Let them tell you that it isn't relevant 
because of so and so and if they prove that that's great but in my view this is very very important information that we all need to reflect on have a great evening A hero, an immune adventure, Humming Heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon, check the links below.